Pneumorphic design is easily the most interesting design trend of recent months. Although to be fair, Apple did use it as a design motif way back at WWDC18. In this video, we'll look at how you can build pneumorphic designs using SwiftUI, why you might want to do so, and most importantly, how you can modify those designs to be more accessible. Now this is important. Pneumorphism, sometimes called neomorphism, has serious implications for accessibility. So though it's tempting to watch the first part of this video, then skip the rest, I encourage you to stick around and learn the downsides as well as the upsides so you get the full picture. Now before we get into some code, I want to briefly touch on the two core principles of this design trend. So it'll be relevant as we progress. First, it uses highlights and shadows to define the shapes of objects on the screen. And second, contrast is generally reduced. Full white or full black aren't used which is what allows the highlights and shadows to stand out. The end result is an extruded plastic sort of look, a UI design that certainly looks fresh and interesting without being harsh on your eyes. Now I can't repeat enough that reducing contrast and relying on shadows for shapes has serious impacts on accessibility. And we'll be coming back to this later on. However, I still think it's worth taking the time to explore new morphism in SwiftUI. Even if you don't use it in your own apps, it's a bit like a, a coding kata that will help you hone your skills. Okay, enough waffle, let's look at some code. The simplest starting point is to build a pneumorphic card, which is a uh, rounded rectangle that contains some information. From there, we'll look at how you can move it over to other parts of SwiftUI, but the principles remain the same. To start making a new iOS project like this one, use the single view app template, and make sure you use SwiftUI for the UI, Otherwise, this will be a very confusing video. I've named mine Pneumorphism. Call yours whatever you want. Now, if you have access to uh, Xcode's preview window, that's this canvas over here, I highly recommend you enable it. You'll find it much, much easier for experimentation. So we're going to start off by defining a color to represent our off-white shade. Remember, no full white, no full black. It's off-white. So it's not gray. It's a, a subtle tint. Add a little bit of warmth or coolness to your UI. Now, if you want to, you can use an asset catalog for this and a named color, um, but here it's just easier in code. I'm gonna go ahead and add an extension to color. I'll say in my code, extension color. I'm gonna find my off-white color right here. I'll say static let off-white equals uh, a color, and I'll use the initializer red, green, blue. And for red, I'll say 225 divided by 255, so quite red. And for green, I'll say 225 divided by 255, so quite green. And for blue, again, it's slight tint, it's not gray, it's a slight tint. I'm gonna say 235 divided by 255. It's a really, really subtle bluish off-white color. So yes, nearly white, but still dark enough that actual white will stand out like a glow when we need it. So now we can fill in the body for our constant view down here. It's just hello world right now. Um, we can give it a Z stack that takes up the full screen and use our new off-white color to fill that whole space. So I'll replace text hello world with a Z stack. And inside there, I'll just do our color dot off white. So it fills the whole screen. Uh, I'll tell this thing uh, edges, ignoring safe area dot all. And then ask my preview to resume. So I'll hopefully see how that looks. And boom, I mean, you probably can't even tell in the video that's not white, but it isn't quite white. If you play it back in the simulator, uh, you'll see the uh, white status bar does stand out ever so slightly in that background. So it's not pure white, it's just that off white. So that pure white stands out as a glow. So we're gonna use a rounded rectangle for our card and we'll fix it as 300 by 300 to make it a nice and clear space on the screen. So we'll do that by going back to our code. And after the off-white Z stack, I'm gonna add our rounded rectangle. So I'll say there's a rounded rectangle. And I'll use the corner radius initializer. And I'll say it's got a 25 point corner radius with a frame, and I'll do width of 300, height of 300, like that. And that'll have a default uh, color of black. So you see it jumps into space there, taking up all the space in a rather ugly black color. Um, but of course, in pneumorphism, 
We want to dramatically reduce contrast. And so we're going to replace that black color with the same off-white color we used for our background, effectively making that shape completely invisible. So down here, I'm going to say before the frame, dot fill, color, dot off-white, like that. So now you can't see it. In the preview, you can see it. it's got a blue border around it, but it's basically gone. Um, and so we've hidden the box effectively. But now for the important part. We define where that rectangle shape exists using shadows. One dark and one light, as if there were a light casting rays from the top left corner of the screen. Now, this is actually fairly easy to do in SwiftUI because we can apply modifiers like shadows multiple times, which makes neomorphism super easy to achieve. And so we're going to add two modifiers to our rounded rectangle. We're going to say this thing is filled in uh, the color off white has a frame of 300 by 300, but then has a shadow. And I use this color radius x, y initializer here. I'll say the color is going to be color dot black dot opacity, so not full black, 0.2. So mostly transparent black. Uh, for radius, I'll do 10 points. Then for x, the offset of this thing, I'll say offset by x10 and y10. So it'll appear just about in the bottom right of the, the square here. And then we'll do another shadow in the top left corner. So I'll say another shadow, again with color radius x and y. The color will be color dot white. So a white shadow, but with an opacity of 0.7. So 70% visible. Uh, radius is still 10 points. But for x and y, I'm going to do minus 5 and y minus 5. So pull it 5 points up and left. So we've got a dark shadow in the bottom right and a light shadow offset in the top left. And that light shadow becomes visible because we used off-white for our background. And the combination of the two, if I uh, build the code and run it back, hopefully you can just about pick out, we have this white glow defining the rectangle here and then also the shadow down here. So it becomes visible on the background because of those two shadows. And we've written what? I mean, that's pretty much all our code plus a, a color here but already we have this nice pneumorphic card. I hope you'll agree SwiftUI makes this surprisingly easy. As UI elements go, cards like this one are fairly low risk for pneumorphism because as long as the UI inside the card is clear, that card border itself could easily not exist and you wouldn't really affect the accessibility of your UI. Buttons, on the other hand, that's a different matter because they exist to be tapped, right? And that's the point of these things. So reducing their contrast can do more harm than good. I want to explore this with you by making a custom button style, which is how SwiftUI lets us share button configurations in many places. This is much more convenient than trying to attach lots of modifiers to every button we create, having lots of these things below every one of them. You just define the style once and share it in many places. And we're going to start by making a button style that's effectively empty. It's a passing through stuff. So it will hand us the, the label for the button, which might be some text or an image or, or both or, or neither, do something else entirely. And we'll send it back unmodified. So I'll go ahead to go to Xcode and add this struct somewhere outside of content view so it can be used elsewhere. I'll say struct simple button style. I make this thing conform to the Swift UI protocol button style. If you want conformed button style, you must implement one method called make body. And I'll just make this thing return some view like that. Boom. And in here, all we'll do is take the label we were given and send it back. So the text or the image, whatever it is we were given, we don't care what it is, just send it back straight away. And that configuration label is what holds the contents of the button. And we're going to add more to it shortly. First though, I want to make a button that uses that style so you can see our design evolve over time. So I'll get rid of this rounded rectangle down here in content view and replace it with a button. I'll say there's a button with an action. And we'll say when it's tapped, we'll just do button tapped. Doesn't really matter what that does, but it's just there as a placeholder. And for its label, the thing inside there, I'll do an image using the system name initializer to get SF symbol stuff. I'll say heart.fill and then give that thing a foreground color of dot gray and critically button style our simple button style, like that. So it knows to use our 
custom UI for the button, which right now, of course, is just a pass-through. There's nothing like special at all. You can see it there in the uh, uh, canvas. If I run it back in a simulator, you'll see what I mean. It's just a, an empty, simple button. Boom. It's, it's nothing special, right? We can fix that by adding our new morphic effect to the button style. Uh, this time, we're not going to use a, a rounded rectangle because for simple icons like this one, a circle looks better. But we do have to add some padding. So the tap area is nice and big. So uh, back in Xcode again, I'm going to look for this make body method where I send back the label. I'm going to modify that thing so we add some padding around our button, then place our new morphic effect as a background to the button. So I'll say, have that label, then a padding of 30 points on all sides. Then for the background, let's uh, tab this neatly, boom, and in there and there. For the background, I'm going to place a circle using the fill of color dot off white, our custom uh, white color. And then I'll apply our pneumorphic shadows. So I'll say we have the first shadow, which was, if you remember, let's use the initializer, that one. It was color dot black with the opacity of 0.2, uh, the radius of 10, x of 10, and y of 10. And then uh, the second shadow was that initializer color dot white dot opacity 0.7. Radius this time will be 10 still, but we'll use minus 5 and x minus 5 for the shadows offset make it look uh, not quite so far away as a dark one. And I'll run that back in a simulator again, and you'll see how it looks. Boom. So you can see we've basically gone a lot of the way towards the effect we want, um, but it doesn't behave well in practice. You know, if I, if I try and press this button, you'll see it prints out button tap, which is, which is great, um, but there's no visual representation of that. It just looks odd. It's not moving or highlighting or pressing in or something when it's activated, which just looks odd, quite frankly. Uh, and to fix that, we have to read the isPressed property of the configuration passed to our make body method over here in Xcode. This thing. That'll tell us if it's pressed down or not, if it's actively being held down by the user's finger on iOS or uh, mouse pointer on, on macOS. And it's our chance to adjust our styling to give some sort of visual indication of whether the button's currently pressed. Uh, and again, we're gonna start simple and work our way forward. We're gonna start by placing our background in a group and then check configuration is pressed and if it's either uh, down or up, depending on whether it's pressed or not. So I'll say that our background here has a group inside of it and I'm gonna put this whole circle in that group like that, uh, boom. And then inside the group, that's where I'll check if it's pressed or not. So I want to say here, if the configuration is pressed. So I'll say if configuration dot is pressed, then we'll just do a off white circle. So I'll say circle dot uh, fill color dot off white. If it's not pressed, if the user's not holding down it right now, then we're gonna show our existing circle code like that. So everything hinges on the value of this is pressed. Is this thing being held down right now? So hopefully if I press Command R, we can give that a try. And there's our button. And if I try and press it this time, you'll see it goes down and up again. And out comes button tapped. So that's working quite nicely. I can press lots of times and you'll see lots of button taps here. If I clear that output window and press again on the heart, you'll see button tapped. If I press over here, away from the heart, you'll see it goes down and up. But there's no more button tap being printed out. I've got to tap on the heart itself to get button tap being printed out. Tapping on this space triggers the down up motion, but isn't triggering the button itself, uh, which is a, a problem. And we so we actually just accidentally made the tappable area for our button really, really small. You have to tap the image itself inside the button not the uh, pneumorphic design around it. Um, to fix that, it's actually very simple. We have to use the content shape modifier saying this thing is a full circle. Uh, and you'll put that after the padding. So it factors in the padding to the button size, forcing SwiftUI to use all available space for that tap. So I'm gonna do that in our code now. Here's our padding being applied. I'm gonna say this thing at this point has dot content shape 
of circle like that. Use all the space we have. And now if I press Command R again, I can tap anywhere to get the effect, but also see button taps being printed out each time. So that's a big improvement. So this kind of looks okay. I mean, it, it's 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 better. The button's obviously got two states now at least, which is better than nothing. Um, but we can do better. Now we could create a uh, fake depressed effect by flipping the shadows, basically copying our two shadow modifiers from the regular effect and exchanging the white and black values for the X and Y. Um, let's give it a try, see how it looks. So you can see what I mean by uh, fake, because it isn't really uh, ideal. So I have our, our modifiers here. I'm going to take those two and apply them to the is press state as well. So we have the same uh, shadow on pressed and not pressed. Um, but what we want to do though is flip the X and Y value. So we have the black being put at X10, Y10, and white being put at minus five, Y minus five. We'll put those around. So we'll say black we put at minus five, Y minus five, and X we'll put that at 10 and 10. So we've flipped around the X and Y for the white and black. Uh, and that'll cause this sort of faux depress effect. Let's try it out and see what you think. And our button, and I press down on it. There you go. So, I mean, it, it kind of works. So our current code works. It works fine. But people interpret this effect differently. Some see this thing when it's pressed in as a concave button when it's being pushed inwards. Uh, others see it as still being convex, you know, raised out the way, but with the light coming from a different angle. It's just moved from one light angle to another light angle, which is what, of course, it actually is doing. Um, a much better idea is to make an inner shadow. And it looks much more like the button is being pressed inwards. Uh, now, this doesn't come in uh, SwiftUI as standard, but we can make one easily enough. Uh, now, creating these things requires two linear gradients. And these will be the first of many gradients we'll be making in this video here. So we're going to add a small helper extension to linear gradient to make these standard gradients easier to make. I'm going to go up here uh, before our struct and add an extension on linear gradient. And this will be a new initializer that takes a colors variadic, like that. So it'll be one color, three colors, 10 colors, 1,000 colors, I don't really care, some number of colors in there. And all we'll do is pass it on to the regular initializer, like this, passing in a gradient, like this, and for the colors, we'll do whatever colors they passed into us. So I'll just say colors, colors. For the start point, I'll say dot top leading, so the top left corner. And the end point, I'll say dot bottom trailing. So it'll end in the bottom right corner. Get these diagonal gradients uh, now very, very easily. So with that in place, we can now just provide a, a list, a variadic list of colors to get back a linear gradient uh, of them in a nice diagonal direction. It's gonna look great. So now that's the important part. Rather than having our two flipped shadows down here, this little uh, hack, <laughs> um, we're going to do something quite different entirely. We're going to overlay a new circle on top of what we have, our pressed circle. Then give this new circle a stroke and blur that stroke to so get this blurry stroke. Then mask that blurred stroke with another circle that has a gradient. Now, that's a lot but I'll try and break it down. So our base circle is the pneumorphic effect circle we have right now. That's our base circle filled with our off-white color. We then place a circle over that, stroke with a gray border, and blurred a little bit, so we've got a soft gray border edge over our pneumorphic effect button. We then mask that overlaid circle with another circle, this time filled with a linear gradient. Now when you mask one view with another view, SwiftUI uses the alpha channel of the mask to determine what should be shown of the underlying view. So, this is the important part. If we draw a blurry gray stroke, then mask that with a linear gradient of black to clear, alpha zero, and the blurry stroke will be invisible on one side and fade in on the other side. This lovely smooth gradient effect, it looks great. And to make the effect more pronounced, we can actually offset these stroked circles a little bit in either direction. And with a little experimentation, 
I found that drawing the light shadow in a thicker line really helped, uh, you know, maximize the effect, really hit hard on the pneumorphism. And remember, pneumorphism uses two shadows, one light and one dark to create a sense of depth. So we're going to add the inner shadow effect twice with different colors. So I'm going to get rid of some code here. Uh, this is was all in the configuration is press section of our code. I'll get rid of these two shadows. I'll keep our current circle, this thing, and our current fill of off-white. That isn't changing. But I'm then going to do an overlay on that thing there. Come on, you. There we go. Indent slightly. Boom. An overlay inside there. This is our first circle. So I'll say, uh, of our second circle, I'll overlay it with another circle. And if I draw that back, you'll see it, it just looks grim by default because it'll just place a nothing like that. It's useless. Um, if I, actually, I'll run it back in two minutes. You can see what I mean. You should just see a, 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 a colored circle. There we go. So it's a plain white circle. Not what we want. We're going to stroke that thing in gray. So I'll say the overlaid circle has a stroke. Uh, and we want content line width. So the content will be color.gray. A line width will be four. If we run it back again. Uh, we'll see, all being well, there's our gray stroke. I'll then blur that stroked circle. I'll do blur with a radius of four points, so the full width of our line. And that again, you can see what it looks like. There's our blurry stroke. Boom. And then I'm going to move that slightly, dot offset by x2, y2, so just a little bit off, down and to the right, pulling it into the area of our circle. You can see it isn't quite centered on the heart anymore, like that. And now for the important part, we're going to add our third circle, the masking circle. I'll say there's a mask on that, boom, and that mask is another circle this time filled with that linear gradient using our new initializer. And this thing takes a variadic array of colors, so I'll just do color.black and color.clear, like that. So we've got the first circle, which is our simple uh, off-white background. The second circle overlaid it, which has that blurry stroke slightly offset. And that circle is masked using a linear gradient. Uh, and I'll run that back again, and you'll see how that looks. Boom. Look at that. That is an inner gradient right there. Inner shadow. That looks super nice. Great. So that's our first one. And we want two to have the effect, light and dark at the same time. What I would say is that uh, the colors we use for this linear gradient don't really matter. We're going to clear on one side, which is what does matter. Black on the other side could be red or blue, whatever. That's not what you're seeing. When you're seeing this sort of like um, dark area over here, that isn't coming from our black. That's coming from the gray stroke we made. That's what you're seeing there. What we care about for this thing is any color that has full alpha. So even if I had, you know, uh, orange here, it really wouldn't matter. It'll still look exactly the same because it has the same alpha value. So we're doing masking here, not drawing. Anyway, so that is our first overlay. We'll then add a second overlay. So I'll do another overlay here. Boom, not overlay conversion, overlay by itself. Boom, and indent it. That, add another circle inside there. And just like before, we're gonna stroke this thing. I'm gonna use color.white this time. This is the highlighted side. And give it that thicker line width I mentioned to really emphasize the bright glow on one side of this thing. Then uh, for its blur, again, we'll do the same blur radius so it isn't you know, any more blurred than the other one. Then we'll offset this thing. I'll use the opposite of the other one. So it's X minus two, Y minus two. And then uh, again, the mask. So we'll do a mask using the circle, circle, boom. And then uh, fill that thing with a linear gradient. And this thing again, takes some colors. So I'll do color.clear, comma, color.black. So we're going in the other direction now. So we have the same thing, this time in reverse the other side. So let's, uh, are we missing a parens here, that one? That one there, great. Cool. 
So let's run that code back and see how the combination looks. Okay, there's our nice ever sized glow and our nice shadow, both coming together at the same time, smoothly blending in the middle. It looks much more pronounced, but I think much more effective. Now, before we start looking at how we can improve the um, accessibility problems of pneumorphism, let's take a look at how we can play with the effect to create other interesting styles. Uh, so first, I want to go ahead and add two more colors to our color extension up here. We have this off-white color right now. So we're going to add some more here so we have some more constant values to work with. I'm going to say uh, static let dark start, dark start equals a new color with the same red, green, blue initializer. And this time we're going to use uh, for red, 50 divided by 255, so dark, then 60 divided by 255, and blue, 65 divided by 255. This has got a sort of greeny, bluey tint to it. And then static let dark end equals a new color. And again, red, green, blue, boom. And we'll use uh, lower values now. So we'll use red, of 25 divided by 255, and then green of 25 divided by 255, and blue of 30 divided by 255. So it's a greeny bluish color we'll be seeing on the screen. So now we can use that as the background for our content view. We have that off white color right now. I want to switch that out to be this new color instead, uh, which is down here, our off white color. We're going to use our new linear gradient initializer to make that easier. I'll say there's a linear gradient using uh, colors of color dot dark start and color dot dark end boom like that hopefully we'll see our layout the button now looks strange because it's of course got this uh, bright styling on a dark background so we're going to create a new dark style that works better in a dark layout and this time we're going to try and split our code in two we'll create a background view that we can apply any way we want pneumorphic design in our code then a button style that wraps that alongside the padding and content shape modifiers. And this allows some more flexibility, as you'll see. It's gonna be awesome. Uh, so the new background view we're gonna add will actually allow us to specify any shape for our visual effect view. So we aren't just tied to having circles everywhere. Um, and it'll also track whether we want to have a, uh, a uh, concave or a convex effect, you know, is it in or out, depending on an is highlighted property we can send in externally to control the effect externally. So we're gonna start off really simple using the same modified uh, flip of shadow approach we had earlier on, just slightly modified to get a simple press effect. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna make up my, a new view type to handle all that. So I'm gonna, uh, let's go here, it's fine actually. I'm gonna say there's a new struct which is called a dark background. And I'll say this is generic over some sort of shape. So it could be a circle, could be a rectangle, rounded rect, or a capsule, or a custom shape. We don't care what it is anymore. It can handle any kind of shape. And this will be a view. Uh, and it will have two properties inside there. One is, is highlighted, which is a Boolean. Is it currently depressed or not, or activated or not? The second one will be the shape we want to draw like that. And uh, that's the generic parameter coming in. Capsule, circle, whatever. And then in its body, our body sum view, uh, we're going to have our layout of stuff here. This will be our background. We want to draw our, our pneumorphic effect. And this is where we have our is hide the code and whatever we want to. And I'll put all that inside a Z stack. So we can layer things if we need to. We'll then say, if we are currently highlighted, awesome, we will draw whatever shape we were asked to draw. Might be a circle, we don't really care. We'll then uh, fill that with color dot dark end, the darkest dark we have defined. Not black, just dark. Then we'll use our shadow and the color, we'll say color dot dark start. Radius will be 10, X will be five, and Y will be five. Then uh, we'll do another shadow with the color of color dot dark end, where it's 10, and we'll do minus five. Oops, minus five. There we go, and minus five. That's if we're highlighted, draw 
that dark end with the shadow on either side. Otherwise, if we're not highlighted, we'll draw the same shape, then fill that with color.darkEnd, still same color. We'll then give that a shadow using color radius X, Y. Color now will be color.darkStart, boom, uh, with radius of 10. And this time I'm gonna have uh, minus 10 and minus 10, giving a, a stronger uh, view when it isn't being pressed. And then we'll do the other shadow using color again of color dot dark end, radius of 10, X of 10, Y of 10. So we have both these shapes being used for the uh, button, depending on whether it's pressed or not. So the modification here is fairly simple. Uh, the shadow size is slightly smaller when it's depressed. It's not 10 points, it's five points. That's the small difference I've made. This it looks better in dark mode, I think. Um, so that is our dark background. Some sort of view we can put behind something else. It's not a button style. It's a generic background that can be used anywhere. That's important. We can now wrap that inside a custom button style that applies padding and a content shape. So we'll say struct dark button style conforms to button style. Let's make some space down here. There we go. Uh, and we'll have, you know, funk make body like last time and make this thing just return some view. Boom, like that. And we'll pass in our configuration label, whatever's inside the button. Give it that padding of 30. In our case of these buttons, this will have a content shape of a circle, like that. And for the background, we can now use our new view. We can say that our background uses our dark background view. And we'll have to pass some parameters here. So we'll say is highlighted will be configuration dot is pressed. And for shape, we'll use circle. We could use something else we wanted to, but circle here is fine. And finally, we can activate that for our button. Because right now we have this button down here in content view, which is a simple button style. We can activate that by saying, I want a dark button style here instead. And give that a try. Let's see what you think of that. I'll press play and we'll see ourselves here. You can see lovely sort of pillowy smooth button and we press in, flips around like that. Really simple but nice effect I think. Give that a little code we've wrote, I think it looks pretty good. So now's a really great time to experiment with this effect. So it'll help you understand what SwiftUI is doing for us, how these button styles work, and how pneumorphism can fit into your UI designs, if at all. Uh, for example, we could create a smooth bump-like button by adding a linear gradient. We have this sort of flat color right now, this sort of dark end color in the middle, uh, and we could add a smooth gradient there instead using a linear gradient and flip it when it's pressed. And this is really easy to do thanks to that initializer we made for linear gradient. So um, back in our code, uh, we have, boom, up here, we have this whole dark end thing going on. That works to get started with. We replace that with a new linear gradient and give this thing color.darkEnd and color.darkStart as its parameters. And then put the same thing down here in the unpressed state and just flip those around. So we'll do colors.darkStart uh, and then color.darkEnd. So the same uh, values, just in a different order. Now if you try that, you'll find hopefully this sort of smoother, there we go, super pillowy effect now. You can just press that in. Look at that, it's a bit squidgy. Lovely. Um, it animates up and down as you release it and activate it. It looks nice. I happen to find the animation a bit distracting. Um, so I would recommend that you disable it. That's fortunately very easy to do. If you go back to your button code down here, um, you can just say after this background uh, animation, uh, nil and scrap the animation entirely and just get a sort of a, a, a quicker button press going on like that. Boom, there we go. Um, this pillow effect, I think it's fascinating. I think it's very interesting and very nice for some UI designs perhaps. Um, but if you're considering using it, I would suggest you try out uh, at least three changes to help that button stand out a little more because it's just, it's super, super low contrast right now. Um, you know, first, even though it goes directly against the low contrast principles of pneumorphic design, 
I would just ditch this grey colour for the heart. Go with white instead, so it stands out significantly more. So when we have foreground colour grey, I would say instead foreground colour of white. And it pops much, much more as you can see. It was grey, like that, dark and dim, now it's white. Stands out much, much more. You're much closer to getting the recommended contrast ratios for your colours, which is great. Um, secondly, if you add an overlay in the pressed state for the button, not only does it look more like a physical button being pressed, but also helps distinguish that pressed state from its unpressed state. Uh, and this actually is fairly easy to do. So what we have to do is go up to our code again, which was up here. Here's where we're pressing the button or not. And we're setting this thing to have a linear gradient, which is fine. But after that, we're going to add a overlay. We're going to say, add another circle, another shape in this case, because you're using generic, another shape over that thing with a custom gradient to add a little border around it. So I'll say after the fill, uh, dot overlay, boom. And we're going to use the same shape we had already, whichever that is going to be. And we'll stroke that shape using another linear gradient. You can see now why I have that convenience initializer because it makes life so much easier. Uh, I'm going to say this has color.darkEnd, oh, sorry, dark start, and then color.darkEnd. So it's the opposite direction to the fill we have, which was dark end, dark start. This is dark start, dark end. Uh, and then uh, we want to have that stroke have a line width of four points. So a nice chunky border when the thing is being pressed down. And it's a small, small change, but let's try and see, see what I mean. It's pretty clear. When it's pressed in, click. See that nice bevel appears around the button is now more obviously being pressed, which is an important thing. Having actual visual representation of activity, you know, really, really matters. Who knew? Um, you know, for an even sharper look, you could actually remove these shadow modifiers entirely. You don't need these two if you don't want them for the pressed state. If you were to uh, comment out these two, for example, um, you would get just that sort of pressed bevel like that. So you can choose a nice sort of glowing smooth pillow button where it's not pressed and then harsh uh, pressed in button when it is pressed. Either way, it's pretty clearly not the same state, which is what really matters here. Um, the third thing you could do is to add an overlay to the unpressed state. Again, just to highlight that this is a real button, it's really interactive. Um, and so you just you'd put that after the fill modify in the unpressed state, you'd say overlay using again the same shape we had, stroke that shape, uh, and we're gonna do the whole thing in that dark end color. So it's a dark color uh, with a line width of, let's do four, like that, boom, uh, that, boom. So we get this overlay when it isn't pressed as well. If I press command R, now you'll see it's really clearly a button. It has this nice black border around it. This thing is standing out on the screen. When it's pressed in, and that bevel effect as well. So it's an improvement. It's still not anywhere near as clear as it ought to be, quite frankly, but we're going to get onto that soon. Now, one of the benefits of splitting our button style from our pneumorphic background style is that we can now add a toggle style using that same effect. This means making a new struct that conforms to SwiftUI's toggle style protocol, which is similar to button style, except that first we get configuration.isOn to track whether the toggle is enabled or not. And second, we have to make a button ourselves to handle the actual toggle action, to flip that is on Boolean, or at least some sort of on tap gesture or similar. So what we can do is we can go back to our code and then underneath here, underneath dark button style, we can add a new struct to handle our toggle style. I'm gonna say struct dark toggle style conforms to toggle style. And just like button style, this has one method you must provide, which is called func make body. And it returns some view, like that. Inside there, we have a button to toggle that Boolean. So we'll say button has an action. And all we'll do in there is say is configuration dot is on dot toggle. Flip the Boolean every time this button is tapped. And then for the label of the button, I'm going to say our configuration label. So again, what's inside the toggle with some padding. So I'll say 30 points of padding. Again, a nice chunky 
thing to tap. Uh, with the content shape of our circle. And then after the button, not the image or label inside the thing, I'm going to apply our new morphic background effect. So I'll say we've got a background using that dark background we made earlier. Is it highlighted? That's going to depend on configuration dot is on. I have a shape, we'll use a circle again, like that. And we want to put one of those in content view so you can try it yourself and see it in action. So to do that, we're going to start by making a new property that will track the current Boolean property being flipped in the toggle. So down here in content view, I'm going to say we have at state private var is toggled, catchy name, is false by default. And next, we're going to wrap this button we have already inside a VStack with a spacing. So we can place the button and the toggle side by side so you can see them both in action as we work. So we'll say before the button, there is a VStack and push all that inside there. I don't really want this button and toggle to be overlapping because their shadows would look strange. So instead, I'm going to add a little bit of spacing to that VStack. I'm going to say this thing has spacing of 40 points. So things are spaced out quite nicely on the screen. Then below the button, I'm going to say there is a toggle. And for its is on property, I'm going to give it dollar is toggled like that. For its label, we'll do the same thing we had before, which was image uh, system name. I'll use heart.fill again, creates a nice little shape. Uh, with the same foreground color dot white, so it's nice and bright on the dark background. And we'll use our toggle style, toggle style of uh, dark toggle style. Boom, like that. Uh, so that's our new content view using our custom toggle style, like that. I'll press Command R. All being well, it should retain the same theme we already made for the button. So on top, we have our button, like that, and below, I toggle. It's now pressed. Press it again. It's unpressed. So we now have that same pneumorphic design, that same piece of code being shared in both places. It's a much, much easier way to work. We've now had ample time to play around with the various pneumorphic styles, but I want to address its problems head on. The extreme lack of contrast we have in our buttons and our toggles and other important controls means they don't stand out sufficiently from the other things around them, which makes it hard for folks with vision impairments and similar to use our apps. Now this is a point where I've seen some confusion circling, so I want to try and clear a few things up up front. Yes, I realize Apple's default buttons just look like blue text, okay? Um, they don't look like buttons, at least at first. But they do have a high contrast ratio, so they stand out on a white or dark background. Second, it is not enough to say, well, it works fine for me, but I'll add a special option to make it more accessible to folks who need it. And that doesn't work. Accessibility isn't a, a, a nice thing to have, it's a requirement. Our app should be accessible by default rather than opt-in accessible, available to everyone by default. That's our goal. And third, uh, the controls we made, this button and this toggle, they're still SwiftUI buttons and SwiftUI toggles, which means that all our changes haven't affected their visibility or their functionality for VoiceOver or Apple's other assistive technologies. Um, now, you already saw, with a very simple change, how you could switch out gray icons for white icons and get an immediate boost in contrast without losing too much pneumorphic, quite frankly. But buttons and toggles still need a lot more contrast if they want to really be accessible to everyone. So we're going to explore what changes we could make here to help things really stand out without straying too far from the pneumorphic design style. First, I'd like to add two new colors to our extensions. We have some bright colors to work with, some really contrasty colors to work with. So up here in our colors extension, all the way up here, boom, Below dark start and dark end, we're going to add two new colors. We'll say static let light start equals a color using red, green, blue. And these are going to be much brighter. So red is 60 divided by 255. Green is going to be 160 divided by 255, so quite green. And then blue will be 240 
divided by 255. So almost full blue. So this is going to be a cyanish blue. Then we'll say static let light end, the other side of our light gradient. It's going to be another color. And we'll say this has the same red, green, blue. And all we'll do is halve the values from the start. So we'll say red will be 30 divided by 255, green will be 80 divided by 255, and blue will be 120 divided by 255. So those are the new colors we want to include in our gradient. The second step is going to duplicate our existing dark background struct. So we have it down here somewhere, uh, dark background. I'm going to select that whole thing and just copy and paste it in there. Boom. I'll rename it from dark background to be colorful background, like that. Now I'm not going to change anything else inside there. We'll do that shortly. We'll get some setup done first, though. That's enough for now. And a third step will be to duplicate the dark button style and dark toggle style structs. I'll select both those two, paste both those in, and call this the colorful button style, and call this the colorful toggle style. And inside there, they will use colorful background and not dark background, here and here. Boom. OK. That hasn't actually changed anything yet. We've just copied and pasted stuff and renamed it slightly. We're almost done though with the setup code. Uh, we're going to go down to content view now, where we make our button and our toggle, and we'll make those things use the colorful button style instead, and the colorful toggle style instead. Now remember, we haven't actually changed what those styles do. If you press Command R, it'll build and run your new code, but it will look identical, right? And here's our buttons. Pressing it, it presses in and toggle it like that. Nothing's actually changed here, okay? To bring our colorful version to life, we're going to change the modifiers. If we go to our code again up here for colorful background. Where are we? Dark button, color background here. We have uh, fill overlay, shadow, and shadow. We're going to change the fill and overlay modifiers for the pressed and unpressed states. So when it's highlighted, this thing here is true. When it's toggled on or the button's being held down, we're going to change dark in the overlay to be light and in the fill. So they, rather than using dark start and dark end, it'll be a light start, a light end in the fill and overlay. So here we have dark end, I'll say light end. Then we have dark start, that becomes light start. Then light start here. And light end there. So a fairly small change. But if you're on the app now, you'll already see it looks like a big improvement. I press Command R, and press these buttons. Boom. It's now got a much clearer, brighter, more obvious activated state. That toggle is now clearly on. It's ready to go, right? But we can still do better. You know, we, we you have the uh, same color, this, this blue could be applied around the button, around this sort of black thing here, when the button isn't pressed, helping draw attention to it, making it clear this thing is an interactive button. Uh, so to do that, we have to modify the overlay modifier here, this thing here, for our um, non-highlighted state. We have dark end right now as a solid sort of dark color around the circle. We'll change that to be a linear gradient using uh, color.lightstart and color.lightend. So we have dark start and dark end for the fill, and then light start and light end for the overlay. So using different colors at the same time. I'm going to press Command R now. You should see how that looks. Boom. So the button and the toggle, when they aren't pressed, have a blue border around them that makes it clear these things can be activated. They stand out from the background really nicely. They still get the sort of full-on button press when they're depressed or activated like that. And it, I think it looks significantly better and certainly a lot clearer for everybody, not just folks with vision impairments. In practice, you're just not going to have all these multiple button backgrounds and button styles and toggle styles in the same app. You're just not, unless you like creating a headache for your users. But it is fun to experiment. And I hope that's something that's come across in this video, because you can create some really beautiful effects without a great deal of work, thanks to the way 
SwiftUI lets us apply modifiers again and again, like shadows and offsets and more. Now, I have repeatedly said that I hope you always keep an eye on your app's accessibility. That means more than just making sure VoiceOver works with your UI, okay? Make sure your buttons look interactive. Make sure your text labels and your icons have sufficient contrast ratios to their backgrounds, at least four and a half to one, aim for seven to one, really contrasty. And make sure your tap areas are nice and large, at least 44 by 44 points. So by all means, use Pneumorphic Design to experiment, have fun, use it to help increase your knowledge of SwiftUI. But never forget, if you sacrifice usability for a fancy new design trend, no one wins. If you enjoyed this video, hit the subscribe button. I make lots more like this one, teaching you Swift, SwiftUI, and much more free right here on YouTube.